I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 9. We'll read again verses here in just a few moments, verses 35 through 38. I hope that you've been blessed by this time to be able to worship our risen Lord together this morning. I um, a, a lot of times with, with as we're singing, I enjoy being able to flip through uh, the scriptures and, and look at different passages that come up uh, to my heart, to my mind as we're singing. And uh, a lot of times I'll keep my eyes closed and I'm always humbled whenever I feel a little tap on my, my stomach. And uh, this morning it was Beth- Bethany, don't come up tapping my tummy, all right? I mean, it's, it's, it needs to be a certain tapper. But Bethany came up and tapped and so I, I sat down to, to hear what she had to say. And you never know what it is that they're going to say. But, um, but what she said this morning was, I don't know when I'm going to be ready to accept Jesus in my heart. And I said, well... We'll talk about it later, but I sure am proud, and I didn't tell her this part, but I sure am proud that we get to be a part of a church that as we worship God, it's known and it's apparent to those that are here that the reason we're here is not for ourselves, but it's for the glory of our Lord. And that, and what we do as we're singing together, as we're worshiping together, as we're receiving the word together, all these things, what we're doing is we are wanting to draw attention for all, directing it towards Jesus Christ and towards our Father in heaven. So thank you, church, for your faithfulness to worship. Look with me in Matthew chapter 9. I'd like to read for us verses 35 through 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we are grateful for this day and for this time which you have given to us to be able to gather together in your name to declare your praises and worth, to receive your word, and to respond to you. Father, I do pray that if there are those here among us today, and I I know there are, that that have never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that that you will let them clearly hear your gospel today, and that you will do what only you can do, and, and that your Holy Spirit will convict them, not just of sin, but of their need for a Savior, and that they will make that choice to place their faith in you. Father, we want to celebrate the fact that you leave the 99 to go after the one. And we thank you, God, that you are faithful to do so time after time after time. So, Lord, bless this time. May your name be praised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're continuing on this morning in Matthew chapter 9. Last week, we really focused on verses 35 and 36. And we're going to kind of carry on that same theme of what we discussed last week, that we will never share in the practices of Jesus until we share in his perspective. So we will never share in the practices of Jesus what it is that he did here on earth until we have the same perspective, the same outlook as that which Jesus has. So let's consider and review for just a moment Jesus' perspective, all right? It's two things. First of all, Jesus' perspective is compassion for the crowds. So remember what it is that Jesus is doing. He's traveling throughout all the cities and villages. He's teaching in the synagogues. He's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and he's doing some therapy. He's healing every disease and every affliction. And then it says in verse 36, when he saw the crowd, so remember what Jesus did. He took the time to stop and to really let soak in the lives of those who were around him. He took time to consider all that they were experiencing. He took time to reflect upon their needs. And as he did this, the Bible says he was moved for them. He had compassion for them. There was a tugging within his heart that he felt for these people because they were harassed. They were helpless. They were cast aside. They were 
like sheep without a shepherd. They are left to their own wanderings, and they needed someone to guide them and to help them. So he looked past their worldly realities, and he perceived their deepest needs. Now, I can tell you with 100% certainty what everybody's biggest problem is. Death. It's everyone's biggest problem. I mean, we know that there are certainties in life. Death and taxes, right? We know this. But death is an issue. Death is a problem because there's absolutely nothing you can do to stop death from coming. You cannot have enough money or enough scientific advances in the world to be able to always place breath within your lungs. As we sang, God's the one that places breath in our lungs, and we're the ones privileged to pour that breath back out to Him in praise and honor of His holy name. Death is man's biggest problem, and we know why we face death. It's because of sin. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. You are guilty of sin. Romans 6.23 tells us what you deserve because of sin. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But it goes on, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Hebrews 9.27 tells us that man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. So think about this for just a moment. There is going to come a time when you will take your last breath. And then you will stand before Almighty God in judgment. You will face judgment. You can't hide in the corner. You can't hope someone more guilty than you comes up before you. You will stand before Almighty God and be judged for all of your deeds good and bad that's just a fact of life and it's a fact that we really don't like to consider but it's true nonetheless so jesus looked out among these crowds he had compassion for the crowds because he realized their biggest need but then we also see that jesus had this perspective my father has the solution I mean, just think about that for a moment. In your mind's eye, just picture for a moment Jesus thinking this, Daddy's got it. I mean, we love these shirts, right, that says Grandpa can fix it or Dad can fix it, and it's all kinds of varying statements, some vulgar, a little less vulgar. But, but the idea that Dad's got this, he, he can fix this, or Grandpa's got this, he can take care of whatever issue this is, whatever toys are broken, he can fix it, or he can all of a sudden make it materialize into a brand new one, right? That's the beauty of Amazon Prime. It can just be fixed in a moment's notice. I, I love this thought. Jesus said, my father has the solution. And we know that Jesus believed this because of what he told the disciples in verse 37. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest you say how is it that we know jesus believed that god could take care of anything that was faced anything that we face well i like to think maybe as jesus was growing up there are some times where his mom mary would remind him of a very important time in her life and in the life of their family where this angel appeared to mary he said, blessed are you, favored among women. Gives this promise, you shall bear the Son of God. And she says, how is this possible? I I'm, I'm still a virgin. I haven't known a man yet. How, how is this going to take place? And do you remember what the angel said? The Holy Spirit shall come upon you. This is going to be a work of the Lord God. And then he says this in Luke 1, nothing will be impossible with God. I like to think that perhaps as Jesus was growing up, his mother Mary would remind him of that statement. And that the same statement which his mother lived by, Jesus lived by as well. For nothing will be impossible 
with God. And we know that Jesus believed this and practiced this as we look in John chapter 17 at this intercessory prayer that Jesus prayed before being arrested. Right, turn your Bibles with me to John 17. Now, I want you to read just a portion of this with me. And by a portion, I mean the majority of it, but, but we'll still just read a, a part of it. But John 17, we see Jesus practicing this idea, this belief that the Father is in control. Notice what he does in verses 6 through 19, as he prays for the laborers, as he asks for the laborers to be protected. John 17, starting in verse 6, he says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you have sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I'm coming to you. Holy Father, Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction. The destruction. Do you, uh, did any of you see this meme this week? I'm sorry, this is a time out, but it's worth it. Apparently, I don't know, was it Popeyes or churches? Someone tried to pick a fight with Chick-fil-A. And uh, someone put up a, a little meme of Da Vinci's, or whoever painted it, The Last Supper, you know, where the disciples and Jesus are gathered around. And it's, Jesus says, surely one of you will betray me. And there's a bunch of Chick-fil-A cups in front of all the disciples, except for Judas. And he has the other chicken places cup <laughs> in there. <laughs> I mean, I just love that. That's <laughs> Surely one of you will betray me. So anyway, sorry. Verse 13. That's why you shouldn't scroll social media in the mornings before service. But now, Jesus says, I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have your joy fulfilled, my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Notice this prayer for the laborers. They're not of this world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. We did all that to show this. Jesus knew that God the Father could take care of his own. And so when Jesus had an issue, he took that issue to the Father. We see in verses 20 and 21, not just Jesus praying for the laborers, but he even praying for those who would be saved because of the testimony of the disciples. Verse 20, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Why do we talk about unity so much? Why is it so important for us? Because unity within the church declares the unity of God, declares the glory of God. And Jesus was praying for the disciples. He was praying for those who would hear the message of the disciples. And then he was praying that all of their lives together would affirm yet again the truth that the Father sent the Son for his holy purpose. Jesus' perspective was compassion for the crowds, but also my Father has the solution. And here's what Jesus said is the solution for the fact that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Do you know what the solution is? Pray. Pray is the solution. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew 38, Matthew 9, 38. Therefore, because of this, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus' solution to the issue was pray. This translation I'm reading from the ESV says to pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. Maybe your translation says something similar to that. That word earnestly isn't actually in 
from the Greek text, but listen to where they get the idea from. They get the idea from that word translated as pray. It means to ask, to request, to pray, to beg. To beg. When's the last time that you groveled before Lord God Almighty taking your petitions to Him? Or have you gotten into the practice of just kind of going through the motions? I mean, when's the last time that you were so moved in prayer that you just couldn't hold back the tears? Whether tears of sorrow or tears of of joy when is the last time that you earnestly beg before lord god almighty to do what only he can do since god has called us to pray god has called us to seek his face and because he has called us to do things we can pray first of all with specificity don't you love that i gave you that blank that word to fill on the blank specificity it's like specific with itty right specificity we can pray with specificity so when we pray we are to first of all address our father in heaven because he is the lord of the harvest god owns the fields into which he has sent us i make payments on a little three-tenths of an acre at 741 north beulah but neither the bank nor me owns it god owns it it doesn't matter how small the property is or how big the property is the lord god owns the heavens and the earth that's what the psalmist says in psalm 24 verse 1 the earth is the lord's and everything in it and so when we pray we are praying specifically to our father in heaven who is the lord of the harvest and then we are to pray specifically for laborers we are to pray for laborers now notice remember the the context here to whom jesus is speaking He's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to those who are following him. A disciple is one who closely follows, who closely learns from, and who imitates another. But notice what Jesus tells his disciples to do. Pray for laborers. Here's here's what that word in the Greek means. It means one who is engaged in work, one who is a laborer, one who is a worker. So listen to this. Only those who are engaged in the work, can be called a worker. You don't believe me? Well, I'll prove it. And you do believe me. You agree with me 100%. I remember someone recently telling me a, uh, a story about a cartoon they saw, saw of the highway department, right? And, and we always talk about the highway department. We make fun of the highway department. Anybody from dot here? Okay, good. So we'll, we're safe. We'll scrub. We'll scrub this part out of the uh, out of the sermon, but out of the tape. That's why we don't have nice things right there. Just broke it. But uh, but we all like to laugh at text dot. And uh, someone was telling me about a cartoon they saw where there was a couple of workers and they were down in a hole by the the side of the road and they were digging, right? And so the the foreman there called and said to someone else, "Hey, we're going to need some more shovels here." And because there's a couple guys digging, and then off to the side, there's about four guys without a shovel. So he said, we're going to need some more shovels brought in. So the next side of the cartoon, the next little scene, still has those same two guys digging. But then it has the other four over here with shovels, and they're doing this, right? I mean, that's what we think of when we think of construction workers on the streets. We think of people that rest on the shovel are those people working they're getting paid probably but they're not the laborers they're not the workers do you you see what i'm saying only those who labor can be called laborers that's true in the here and now and that's true in the kingdom of god only those who labor can be called laborers. You know, I think if we were to be completely humble and honest with ourselves, then many of us would realize 
that we cannot truly be classified as laborers. I mean, the potential is there, don't get me wrong. The command and the opportunity is there because Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. So the expectation and the ability is there, but we're not actually doing anything of eternal value and worth. I mean, what farmer, what laborer wanders off into the harvest field, which is all around us, into the rice or the wheat or the corn, and wanders into this field and says, man, this could be a great harvest. This could be just fantastic. There is so much potential in this field and in this crop. I just, wow, that is so impressive. And then goes on his or her merry little way and continues back to wherever it is that they find comfort and relaxation. It's not a laborer who does that. It's one who has rejected the call. So Jesus says, my father has the solution. Pray to him. Pray specifically. Pray that he will send laborers into his harvest. Pray that they will enter into the field at the proper time with intentionality, that they will accomplish the task which is before them. Some of us may think that we are laborers, but we have neglected that labor does not mean presence. It means intentional and obedient work. We all have a job to do. We all have a role to play. As a man I deeply respect often says, you can be a help or you can be a hindrance. I pray that God will lay upon our hearts the desire to be laborers for his kingdom. We can not only pray with specificity, but we also play, pray with confidence. We can pray with confidence for a variety of reasons. The first is this, because we know the will of the Father. We know God's will when it comes to salvation. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, that praying for kings and all those in authority is good and pleasing to God, who desires that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. We know from 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, that when we are praying according to the will of God, God not only hears us, but He answers those prayers. John 5, 14 and 15, and this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of Him. We can pray with confidence because we know the will of the Father, but also because we know the Father's work history. God has the greatest resume given that can ever be shared, and it's all written down right here as we consider the history of redemption, where God in His glory and God in His mercy and God in His grace expressed His love towards us by sending His Son to die on the cross for our sins. I mean, you think about redemptive history, and it doesn't go anywhere other than God. Because man's religions say that we have to earn our way to salvation. God's truth is that He has provided the way, Jesus Christ. So we can pray with confidence because we know what God has done. We know that it's God's desire for men and women to be reconciled to Him through Christ Jesus. I mean, think about it. The greatest proof is he sent Jesus. But we can take it even further. He sent Peter to the Jews. He sent Paul to the Gentiles. He sent Philip to one. Right? Isn't it incredible that Philip was called to leave a city where there are hundreds, possibly even thousands of salvations and conversions taking place, and God, through his Spirit, told Philip, I want you to go out on the road, the desert, road. I want you to head out this way. 
I can just imagine if I was Philip, I'd be saying, why do I have to leave where I'm at? But God said, I want you to go out this desert road. And so he went in obedience. And he encountered this Ethiopian eunuch, one man, devalued by society, one man, outside of the nation of Israel, one man, left hundreds or thousands even being saved for one man. For one man. You see, you might think that, that you're life is limited because there's very few people that you think you actually have influence over their lives and can speak truth into their lives but the value of your life and the worth of your life is not based upon how many followers you have it's based upon the message that you consistently proclaim we need to recognize the blessing that god has given to us of joining in his work of being able to engage one because the one matters to God I I want you to do something with me I want you to say this I belong and matter to God can you do that we'll just do it all together We'll, we'll shorten it even I matter to God say it with me I matter to God say it one more time I matter to God. God cares about the one, and he cares about you. Listen, if God has sent laborers into his harvest in the past, then will he not do so again? What we're asking is that God will send us into this community, is that God will send us into his harvest that god will show that this community matters to him and that we have been placed here for a purpose we're asking that god will send us out to our family maybe even our own children you may have children living in your home that have never given their lives to jesus christ don't neglect what god has called you to do Invest in your children's lives. Show them the gospel of Jesus Christ. What we're asking is that God will send us to our neighbors. What we're asking is that God will send us into this community, into our workplace. That when we check out at the line at Brookshire's, what we see before us will not just be someone who's checking the groceries with whom we can make piddly conversation, but we can see someone who matters to God. Who's loved by God, cherished by God. What we are asking is that God will send us into His harvest. I want to ask you this morning will you join me? Will you join me? If the answer is no, then. May God break that stubbornness. May God convict of sin. Will you join me? And and here's how you can join me, and this is in your bulletin notes. Here's how you can live in obedience before God. And before you rear up and say, don't tell me how I can live in obedience, read God's word. How can you live in obedience? Well, here in just a few minutes, you're going to have an opportunity to come forward and take a who's your one card, and a prayer guide. And listen, I can tell you 100% confidence that the, uh, the excuse, let me pray about participating in this, will not work. You don't have to pray about people being saved. We don't have to pray about lives being changed. Because we know what God desires to do. We know His work history. Come down and take one of these cards. And you can write the person's name, if you know it already. You can write a name on this card. And you can use these scissors. They're not weapons up here, they're scissors. And you can use these scissors, and you can cut on this dotted line, and you can leave this one piece right up here at the altar. And you can take this other with you. And it'll have a little, it's a little bookmark that you can keep in your Bible 
And over the next 30 days, you can make one check at a time as you read this passage of Scripture and pray for the one whom God has laid on your heart. Listen, you can join me in this. There is not a reason that every one of us in this place should not have one for whom we are praying. If we really want to be laborers, if we really want to be a part of the kingdom, then there's not a reason we can't at least be praying for one. So you can come forward and you can take one of these cards and prayer guides. You can also do this. You can pray for your one. You say, well, who is it? How many do you want me to pray for? Four or one? Well, we've been working on the four by four for over a year. So let's reduce a little bit. All right? Let's go down to one. If you're still praying for those ones, I don't have my license in my pocket, but I still have my four by four card in my wallet and I still pray for my four. And here's what I did. I asked God to lay on my heart one of those four whom he really desired me to focus in on. He did it. His name is Brian. And I've been praying for Brian, looking for opportunities to invest in his life. You know what God's been doing over these past uh, about nine or ten days? God's been increasing the frequency with which I have encountered Brian. Listen, God's, God's in the business of saving people. And if we would just yield to him, he would let us join in that wonderful work. Pray for your one. Take one of the four and pray for one. Then do this. Invite your one to join us for worship on Sunday, October the 6th, our Friends Day. A time when we're going to encourage everyone to bring someone with them to worship. Start inviting them now. Start praying now that your one will desire to join us on Sunday, October The sixth, this is what we're about as a church. And you can do this. Pray for God to send laborers into his harvest. I mean, that's that's what Jesus said to do. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I'm praying God will send you and me, us, into this community, into his harvest. And then do this. Be willing to enter the harvest by living with intentionality every day. You have been given such a great blessing and such a great opportunity to have a kingdom impact. To look past what the world says is successful and look past what the world says is needed and confess that God knows what's best. And say, God, these people need you i don't want them stepping into eternity without knowing you and then you can make a difference in their lives oh that god would burden our hearts that god would establish our paths that god would use first baptist hawkins in a mighty and a powerful way to glorify his name and add to the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we are grateful for this day. And we thank you, God, for the challenge which you have laid before us, the challenge to pray, the challenge to pray in humility that you would send laborers into your harvest. Father, I pray that everyone who's in this place and and all of our church members that are in various places today, that you will lay on every one of our hearts one person who needs to know you. Whether it's someone that's in our family or someone that lives in this community or someone with whom we work or someone at the doctor's office that we see on a regular basis, God, I pray that you will lay on our heart one person and that, God, you will place within our hearts a desire to enter into your harvest field as laborers. Father, only you can lay this desire on your church's heart. So God, I ask you today in full confidence that you can and that you will 
hear and answer this prayer. Heavenly Father, God Almighty, I ask, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, the one who died and rose again, in the power of your Holy Spirit who dwells within us, I ask, Father, that you will send laborers into your harvest field. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.